Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of the TriggerCast. Today we have on Dustin Miller from PPC Professionals. He is actually pretty local to us, about 30 to 40 minutes from our office, a good friend and someone that we do a lot of business with. We brought him on today to tell us a little bit more about how he runs his AdWords company and how he manages his clients specifically. A lot of people were always talking tactics, you know, we're always talking how can you increase clicks, how can you, you know, decrease costs. We want to focus on the business side a little bit more with this interview. So, Dustin, thanks a lot for coming on. Sure thing. Good to see you again, Sweeney. Always a pleasure. So, you know, what we're interested to find out today is a bit more about how you manage your clients and how you manage the business. You know, many times when you're in kind of a service industry such as PPC, maybe rep marketing, SEO, working with clients can eat up a lot of your time. So where I want to start is kind of take us through the process of onboarding a client. So we're past the sale, right? I mean, the sales already been made, or maybe if you'd like, you can start kind of with how you do your presentation. But let's say a lead has already come in. Yeah. Where do you go next? So if a lead's come in, it, you know, it, the biggest thing I could say as far as managing them is the expectations you set when you sold the service or the product to them. Um, one of the big things that I've noticed in talking with you know, people in our industry that are either doing pay-per-click or other types of marketing is that they have problems with their clients because they don't either educate them well or they don't set expectations well. And it basically is setting you up to have a problem later. So um, I'm sure you know people watching this video or this hangout have, have been pitched on, you know, buy this software and you'll make, you know, you'll be able to sell this to clients to make millions of dollars. And that's, you know, it's possible, right? But the expectations aren't usually set correctly, which is where people get disappointment. And it's really not any different for our clients, right? So when we get a client and we're thinking about the services to offer him, whether it's PPC or PPC plus local SEO or something else, I mean, we really want to figure out, first of all, what is this person's goal? What is it that they're trying to achieve, all right? Um, one of the big mistakes people make is that they think they know what their clients want and they don't always know. So you're, you know, our, our bottom line is usually like they want to make more money. Well, that's true, but does that mean they want to make, they want to increase volume with their business or do they want to increase profitability? Those are two very different things that need to be taken, uh, have a different path to, uh, to get there. Um, maybe there's some ego involved, like a, you know, maybe a cosmetic surgeon or somebody who wants to be like the top dog amongst their friends. Like that could be a big deal for them. Um, so the biggest thing we like to do is listen to them, set expectations on what it is they're looking for and also what we can do for them reasonably and also over what time period, right? Because the other thing we notice is we have some people that um, no matter how many times you tell them, they assume that they're going to get results like instantly, right? Like you're going to turn my AdWords a campaign that, you know, we've been losing money for two years and you're going to get in there and overnight we're going to like make all this money and they, we never promise them that, but sometimes that's kind of the, the idea or they talk to other companies before us and that was what they were sold. You know, yeah, we'll fix this for you. No big deal. And it's not really like the guy who says he's going to get you to number one on Google tomorrow. And it's like, ah, yeah. that's just not going to happen. Yeah. Well, it might, it, you know, maybe there's some tactics, some long tail keyword he could use, but there's, once again, expectations aren't set. Is he going to get a ton of business from that one Google, you know, first place Google ranking? Probably not, right? So it's all about in our mind, our mind expectation. It's making sure we're on the same page with the client, right? So that's first and foremost. Um, then all, all, you know, after we have an idea of where they want to go, what they're looking for uh, internally, you know, we need to figure out what's the strategy. Uh, if we haven't already explained to the client at that point on the phone, the initial call, we'll have a follow-up call with strategy. Uh, figure out what kind of time frame it's going to take for us to execute, um, how many hours we're going to spend on it internally so we can get pricing together. Um, for AdWords specifically, since that's what we're talking about, there there's usually the question of do we have to uh, do a build out for this, for this client's account? Now, obviously, if you have a brand new person to AdWords, they need a build out. There's nothing there. But when we're looking at a person who's got a AdWords account already that we can look at and do an audit on, uh, there may be a build-out time. So we have to think about the time for that, the time that our team has to complete it, the time that the client, you know, needs to get it done. Sometimes we have clients that have certain deadlines, like they have promotions going. It depends on the industry, but we have one right now where they have a promotion and we'll find, about, find out about it the day before, right? So this is a bad example of 
managing expectations, but some people just don't listen. So you got to do what you got to do. Um, but the idea is to internally uh, understand what the plan is going to be, how it's going to be executed over what period of time, and then price it accordingly. You know, we want to make sure that we're not working for $10 an hour doing high level PPC work. You know, I mean, that's the other side that I think a lot of other agencies, um, either they are okay with it or they, they don't, um, have qualified people working on accounts. And this is from auditing enough accounts from, from big agencies out there. I'm not kidding. There's some crazy stuff that you'll see. I'm not going to name names, but, uh, but if, if you're only able to charge somebody to where you can pay your employee 10 bucks an hour, you're probably not going to get quality work. And I know, you know, Ben, I've talked to Ben about this in the past as well. It's like, if you want, you know, and, and if you want good work, you're going to have to pay for it. Right. If you want somebody to spend 50 hours a month in your account, then you have to expect that it's going to cost you more than if you want them to work on it, you know, a small amount of time. So this is where we need to come to the client and give them the recipe we think we need to make it happen. And that's where we start usually. Makes sense. I know a big thing that happens in SEO is, you know, they talk about small budgets, small results. A lot of times people are expecting the world and back for, you know, say a $500 budget monthly for SEO or something to that effect. And it's part of that's being realistic and saying, hey, if you're only going to spend this much, we're not really going to be able to do much. And yeah, people want the world and they want it at, you know, zero cost. Yeah, well, the problem is that it's been commoditized. commoditized. I think it's, if that's really a word or not. People think it's a commodity and we get that all the time. Um, we had a client we talked to yesterday that went with a cheaper solution for some local SEO and pay per click, and that's fine and everything. But the other guy, you know, being that you're, you know, when you're in the business and you know what the, the different level of services are, it's easy to kind of see through that. But for a customer, they may not know the difference. To them, well, he said he's going to manage my AdWords, and that's what I need. I need somebody to manage my AdWords. Well, what does that really mean? Is he going to do it intelligently? Are they just going to let it like run for months and not even touch it? Which we've seen. A lot of times, those are the companies that usually charge a little bit less. And we've had some companies that actually charge more and do that, ironically enough. But it's typical that you see that because the client's not educated. They don't understand what they're getting. Um, so one of the tips to other agencies is make sure you set yourself apart um, by not being one of those companies and by explaining what you do differently. And how do you guys, you know, what's your pitch when it comes to that? You know, if I were to come to you and I say, Dustin, I got this guy that can manage my AdWords account for $500 a month. Why do I need to pay you this ridiculous a, a, a build-out fee? You know, why would I? Why would I even pay this? What is? What's your kind of differentiator to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, to answer that question, and I didn't mean to cut you off. To answer oh, the question, no it's usually the audit, the AdWords audit. So, um, assuming we're not talking about somebody who's never done AdWords, doesn't have an account, that's kind of a different. Um, pitch, so to speak. But for people who have an account, usually we're going to hop in their account and almost always find big problems, right? So um, we've gotten situations where we were competing for business with some pretty decent sized clients and they had us look at their account. They had maybe two or three other pretty large agencies look at their account. We all did an audit because we're more or less competing for the business. And because we do things a certain way, we take the time to really look at not just the AdWords account, but the business, the overall goals that the client has. We're able to find things these other companies don't find. And usually what it comes down to when we're not competing, if it's just like kind of a one-off deal where somebody wants to uh, switch from one of these larger companies or agencies that charge them less, it, it really comes down to let's see what they've done for you for this money. We do an audit. We find typically problems everywhere, you know, it may not be significant, but there's usually the same story, you know, if they're wasting money on clicks, they shouldn't be. Um, it, the account's not getting the attention it should. There's usually a bunch of missed opportunities, especially once we drill down and talk to the client. And, and that's where we can kind of shine because they realize we kind of get it and we do care and we're not just talking AdWords, we're talking business. You know, we'll look at the landing pages, we'll look at the services they offer, are they defined well, are they, like, are, is everything segmented well, are we able to, to do, you know, budget uh, capping in certain areas of the business that allow us to spend more in other areas that are more profitable, like, we talk about this because we own, we own a business, obviously, right, so we know how to run a business, and we also want to make sure that they understand that when we're doing pay-per-click, we're, we're kind of, like, partnering with them, right, like, we want to have them 
get a return on the money they're putting in AdWords and putting into our management. And we really take that seriously. So kind of, the pitch really comes down to, do you want to get less for less, kind of what we talked about before, or do you want to get the kind of service we offer, it's going to cost you a little bit more. And to be quite frank with you, um, on, a, on a smaller client, we, we are a, a, usually a bigger expense. Like when you're spending $2,000 a month, we have a certain minimum that most companies don't have, you know, because we know what time it's going to take at a minimum to manage this thing correctly. On a larger account, we can be more competitive because we have more room to work with, right? So there's a little bit, we're, we're less um, expensive, I guess, the bigger the dollars become because we can afford to work smarter and, you know, do things in a different level. So it does matter. The, the account build outs, we can explain. Obviously, we get the results we get because we build it out right from the beginning. If you don't have a good foundation, you know, whatever kind of mansion you're going to put on that lot, it's not going to stand up very well, right? Like, we want to have the best foundation. We think of it long term. We really spend a lot of time in it. And we do invest a lot of time in actually building the stuff out. So that's how gotcha. we try to justify and differentiate a little bit. Gotcha. Do you have any headphones by any chance? I'm hearing a little bit of static, and I'm wondering if I have headphones some. might fix it. Uh -huh. Give me a second. Audio. And now, as you're putting on your headphones, I will ask you the next question, which is, you know, I'm sure there's some different softwares and such that you work with, but I'm wondering if there's a particular management style or software that you tend to use. For example, whether it be Basecamp or, you know, leveraging the PPC BizBox for, you know, the audits. What kind of softwares are you leveraging in this process? Uh, software. Can you, can you hear me a little better now? Yep. Okay, cool. All right, so as far as software is concerned, we use task management software. We use Asana internally. It's been a real blessing. We've tried several. That was the one we liked the best. Doesn't I think it's free. Pretty sure we don't pay for it. Um, <clears throat> for, you know, time tracking, there's a, a tool called Toggle or something like that. I don't set the tools up. I just kind of, like, use them. <laughs> uh, Maria on our team, she does that. She's really good at it. Uh, so we use that. We use FreshBooks for our invoicing and accounting. Um, and we use Microsoft Excel for the majority of stuff, building out and things, and obviously AdWords Editor. And we do use PPC BizBox for mini audits, for prospecting, uh, which we have a team that's just starting to really get on the ball with that now. Um, so those are really the tools. I mean, most of the stuff we do is by hand. We don't do a lot of the kind of the bid management stuff or the keyword tools because we realize that most of the time human intelligence is a way better, you know, way better result than trusting the tools. And we've tried and we've tried the word stream tools. We've tried tools that you might have heard of, you never heard of, and none of them seem to actually get the job done. One thing we will be doing is some reporting tools, which we've looked at several. We're trying to get one that can do everything and do it well. And, we, you know, unless you're willing to pay like an arm and a leg for something like Marin, uh, it doesn't always make sense. We're, we're, we're coming together and hopefully going to have a solution for that shortly, but for right now we're just using Excel for reporting as well. And have you ever used, uh, I'm familiar with them more for Facebook ads and other things like that, but have you ever used any of these other custom kind of uh, ads management type softwares? Like which one? Which one specifically? Um, the, I know there's Facebook Ad Expresso. There's another one I'm thinking of that for some reason doesn't come to mind. I know it manages AdWords and Facebook and a few others. I Not really. I mean, as far as, like, you're saying for everyday management or something like for remarketing, like ad uh, roll? For, yeah, no, more, more for management, not for, for... No, I mean, for management, we just do it the old-fashioned way. We just hop in the accounts, do it by hand. I mean, it, you know, for the most part, we haven't really seen a need to get, like, on a huge scale. When we were working on, you know, multi-million dollar a month companies' accounts, they're spending a million dollars a month. Like, yeah, you got to use you know, something crazy like Omniture, which is what they use at the time to do bid management. Uh, my partner Shane could speak to that more, but that was a whole other story, though. I mean, that was a, a software that cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to set up and, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month, but you're managing millions, you know, so it's a, a different story. So we just do it the old-fashioned way. We don't need to, to use any third-party stuff at this time, thankfully. Makes sense. And then, you know, managing the campaigns... Obviously, I have kind of a few small questions. I don't want to get too tactical, but in a similar sense, when it comes to the audits, it comes to the setup, it comes to the ongoing optimization, do you guys kind of have any operational type procedures that you can share with us, kind of from an organizational operational standpoint? Um, 
Yeah, I think so. Uh, normally what we'll do is in the very beginning, like we talked about before, when we're scoping out the job and the work and we are kind of determining what kind of hours we're going to go into managing the account. We're gonna, we know we're going to do certain things every month. We know we're going we're gonna to rotate ads every month. We know we're going to go and add negative keywords every month. We know we're going to create new ad copy. We know we're going to overview the budget and look at We know we're going to do that every month, so we schedule it out at certain intervals during the month or maybe multiple times a week or every other week. depends on the size of the account and what the management fee is and where. And the traffic number is really the biggest thing. Is If there's not a lot of traffic, then you really can't tweak things until you have a certain number of clicks and visitors, right? So... Um, so what we do is basically we know the kind of work we're going to have to do for a client. We just put it in Asana and we schedule it out to happen a certain time each month by a certain individual on the team, whether it's me or the new guy we just hired this week or um, some of the other people that are on the team that are doing it. Um, that's kind of the easiest way to go. I mean, once you know what the scope of work is, once you've done the audit and once you've done PPC long enough, you kind of know what you're going to have to do. And bid management, ad review, negative keywords, all this stuff is stuff that – you're going to do for every client. You just have to decide how often it needs to happen. Uh, if there's anything else in addition, like keyword expansion, when you're going through your your uh, search query report, you might find some keywords that weren't in the account that you wanted to add. So maybe there's an additional build out time. And you just want to make time to have uh, for each of these items so you know it's going to get done every month. And now rewinding a little bit, um, you would mentioned that you're going to start using reporting tools. I imagine kind of the question I have there is, how do you handle the client on a month to month basis? So how do you follow how do you go about following up with the client and saying, "Hey, this is what we did and we had success." You know, are you scheduling calls all the time? Is it just sending over these reports? Is it via email? How do you handle the, you know, client communications without it being too much of a time suck? Well, um, the clients are the best, the ones I can email a report to, <laughs> and they don't either they don't have a lot of questions because it's pretty cut and dry or it's an email response and we're done. There's other clients you got to do more handholding. You got to get on a call with them every week or every month. The bigger clients want more touch points. Obviously, they want to know what's going on. Um, so normally, our if it's like an, an average or very small account like your local business, it's usually a one uh, once a month kind of touch call where we'll either go over the report if they have any questions, or it's going to be an email where we send them the reporting and once again explain the bullet points. You know, we'll give them the Excel spreadsheet has the month over month numbers. We have it graphed out over the last three month period. They can see the trend. Uh, it'll include phone calls if we're doing phone tracking, things like that, you know, outside of AdWords. And basically I cover kind of the bullet points for the period, let them know if they have any questions, they can reach out to me. And some want to talk, some really, that's good enough for them. Other clients, they want to get knee deep into it. They want to know what's going on with their CPA and they're sending us reporting. Like we have e-commerce clients that have a back-end tracking system that we can't really tie back into AdWords, so they send us reporting on a monthly basis, and we look at their reporting, look at the account, and kind of have a, a phone call scheduled based on what we're seeing there for the next plan of action. So it's a little bit different. There's really no, there's really no easy way, but what I would say is, as far as saving time, we try not to talk to people about their account if we don't, like I said before, we don't have enough you know, traffic or data to go over. Like we have some clients that are, they want to spend two grand a month. They're getting maybe, you know, not even a thousand visitors a month, but they want to talk every week. It's like there's really not been enough happening in your account to justify talking about it, right? Like we want to use statistical numbers. We want to have an idea of where the click-through rate is on a statistical basis, not on the last 10 clicks. Like that doesn't tell us anything, right? So some people can over-report, and sometimes the clients lead you into that. Like they expect it, and we had this issue just yesterday, matter of fact, that we had to counteract where people want, you know, a weekly or bi-weekly call on an account that's spending four grand a month and their average cost per click is 10 bucks. You know, so they're getting, you know, 400, uh, 400 visitors a month. Like there's just not enough to talk about every two weeks or every week there, you know? So it's kind of you having to set the expectations with them as well with how often you're going to report, what you're going to report on and what the point of the call is. One of the, one of the other things that's a time suck is hopping on a call for the sake of being on a call and not having an agenda. Like if you're not on there saying, okay, here's what we're going to cover Usually it's nice to do that ahead of time, let them know what you want to talk about. You're going to spend a lot of time with people who either like to talk or ask a million questions, and you have to really kind of be aware of that. And you don't want to be rude and tell them you don't want to answer the questions, but you want to, you know, set the, set the, set the stage of here's why we're having this call, you know, and, and just have a process in place that makes sense and try to stick to it. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, have you ever considered or tried any sort of, 
pricing based on communication. So, for example, and I could see where this is the kind of thing that could be difficult with clients, but if you gave some sort of, you know, $50 a month discount if they chose email reporting only compared to phone calls. We or haven't. Something to that nature. We haven't really because, uh, you know, we, we just basically tell them what we're going to do. I mean, for the most part, right? Like, we're not trying to be rough or cool or nothing, but we just really know what to do. And, and the thing is, if we know we need to hop on a call with these people because it's the best thing to do for the account, we're going to do it. Like, do we like to do it? Of course. Like, who wants to hop on a phone call they don't have to hop on, honestly, right? Yeah. But we're going to do it because we know it's the best thing for the client. So um, we do kind of do the opposite of what you said, where we basically let them know, like, this is how much the account is, this is what the management fee is, and this is the limitation on how many times a month we can talk. We don't necessarily say it's by phone or by email because to us it's not going to be much different. And uh, some people don't communicate well by email, so you end up not getting what you need as the, as the agency. So it almost shoots you in the foot a little bit. Um, so we haven't tried it that way. We just try to set expectations and make sure we limit kind of the amount of time. And we don't really go out and say, you're only going to get an hour of phone calls each month. But if they start calling us every day, every week, we'll be like, listen, you know, we have a monthly call. This is what we do in this time. Feel free to reach out to us, but we're not going to be able to spend an hour on the phone with you and work on your account. Like it's going to have to come from somewhere, right? So we want to make sure we have the time to work on your account, and not just be on the phone. And we want to take action with that. So that's how we try to handle it. Certainly. So now on a managing the business aspect, how do you handle hiring, outsourcing, or VAs? You know, how do you? Because I know in a service business, one of the big problems is scaling your team in relationship to the growth of the business and the growth of the contracts that are coming in and making sure that that's kind of in line. So yeah. how do you approach that? Do you, I mean, do you outsource? Do you leverage VAs? Do you leverage remote workers? Is it all in-house? Uh, it's all in-house. Uh, we do have people who will do web design that are not in-house. So, but we're really upfront. We, we actually have tried to stay away from web design for a really long time. We have a web design project we just took on last week mm -hmm. with a new client who's also doing PPC, who's also going to be doing SEO, who's also doing email. So, And it's actually, it was a referral, so we decided to do that. And at some point, we may do a little bit more on the web design tip. Um, but for now, uh, that would be like the only thing that we're outsourcing at all. Um, maybe some other stuff like building citations, things like that. Then, you know, we have a, a girl in the office who is doing some of the local stuff, but that would be another opportunity where we would maybe use a service or something like that. Um, but for the management side of PPC, it's all in-house. Um, like I would mentioned to you before we hopped on the Hangout, we have a guy that started this week that I've been training myself. So it's been, you know, a little bit challenging juggling the fulfillment and the training and, you know, kind of keeping things going. So I can't tell you I have the perfect answer on how to make everything run like a well-oiled machine, but... Um, we know that the quality of work we need is going to come by somebody we can physically watch do the work and make sure they're doing it right. And we've tried, um, we've not tried outsourcing PPC to other companies, but we have a lot of incoming requests for white label work. So we have agencies coming to us and we're doing some white label work for them. Uh, and I've talked to the people that they've talked to before they've called us. I'm not going to mention any names, and the level of work that these people do is just, it's just terrible. So it's like we don't really have an option to go anywhere outsourcing unless, mm -hmm. like, the person w works with us, does it our way, and it, you know, they're not going to learn that remotely. They're going to have to be there and just, it's going to take months. It's going to take, you know, probably years. Like, our team that we've been together for over two years, almost three years now, I mean, we're still learning kind of how to work things out as we go with certain scenarios because you just can't train a person for every scenario and expect them to start taking and run with it. So we, we've not been able to outsource it like that. We just figured we'd bring people in house, you know, contractors in house, train them up and, uh, and just have them work directly on location. Unless there's, you know, on some days of the week, we, like on Fridays, we're usually not in the office. We'll work from home. That's another story, but they're going to come and meet, you know, we're going to see them on Monday. It's not going to be a, a totally remote thing. So. Gotcha. And um, the white label work, that kind of interests me. How do you handle how do you handle the white label work, especially as a business owner, knowing, okay, I'm gonna make less money on this, but there hopefully should be less, you know, client relationships that I have to deal with. How do you kind of price that out and what makes you decide if this is a good white label deal for you to take or not? Um, 
<clears throat> well, the less money thing is also exactly what you said. There's less client relationships. So if we're white labeling with a company, we're able to give them a bit of a discount because it's up to them to deal with the client. It's up to them to not necessarily provide a reporting. Like we'll give them an AdWords report like you would want to have as a client or as an agency for your client. But it's up to you. If you want to pretty it up, you pretty it up. Like there's less kind of back and forth and handholding on our end with the end client. It doesn't mean that we have less with the agency a lot of times, to be honest with you, but um, it does equal less with that client. So we feel like if we're able to save money on our end, then we'll pass that savings along to the agency. They'll get good quality work. We'll make money and have a little bit more diversity and volume, right? Uh, so it kind of works well. Typically, we are a little bit under where we'd like to be for, uh, you know, what we would charge a regular client. Not by much. I mean, it, we're, we're usually somewhat the same because we're able to, like I said, take off some of the hours we spend on the reporting and the meetings and things. Um, so it works out kind of well in that respect. How do we know we want to take them on? We usually don't want to take on a white label unless they have multiple clients they can give us. In some cases, it's somebody just starting up, and we'll give them a shot, you know. But if they want us to use their email account and their CRM and all this stuff, and they're bringing like one deal to the table for 500 bucks a month, like that's just not going to work. Because by the time we set it up and add a new email account and a new process in place, and they're in our, you know, our work queue. Like we're spending time and money just getting the setup happening, right? So, you know, we don't do it for a lot of agencies and we don't do it for a lot of people. We're, we want to be very careful with how we do it and how many people we do it for. And, uh, and that's kind of how we decide. It's got to be kind of worth it. You know, you got to really have a good way to go. And I've talked to a lot of people recently about it who are, you know, given our information or whatever for white labeling. And I'd be happy to work with most of them. It's just, it's going to be one of those relationships that I tell them straight up, you know, we'll have to figure out how to work together. Um, I try to make sure they understand what we're going to provide and, and make sure that's what they're expecting, right? I don't want to have an issue where, well, hey, I thought you were going to you know, talk to my client every month and, and take their phone calls and their email. And it's like, wait a minute, I, that's a referral agreement there. That's not white label anymore. Now it's like, where are you in this picture, right? So we don't want to do a referral agreement that's masked as a white label. We do all the work for a big chunk less of money, right? That's not what we want to do, and we let people know that. And we also let people know with the white label, we'll offer them um, an account review, right? So this is probably a big thing that, you know, a lot of white labels don't do is we want to actually take a look and do like an audit for the account before we decide to take it on um, because we want to make sure that when we price it for this agency, we price it with they'll know the strategy we have. We'll both know what the cost is going to be. Uh, they'll have something to go back to the client with, the audit or the strategy that they can help sell the deal, right? So it takes more time out of our schedule to do it, but I feel like it helps them sell with confidence. And there's not going to be an issue like we had the other day with a guy who's, he wants to white label with us, but he's basically coming to us saying, hey, I sold this client for, let's just say half the service fee we would normally charge to manage it with no build out fee. I need it done by Monday. This is Thursday afternoon. Like, we've never yeah. seen the account. We, we don't know nothing. Like, you can't come to me and tell me you've already priced something that we, and you expect us to deliver on where we haven't even looked at it. Like, that doesn't work. And we don't have a white label agreement with the guy yet. This is his trying to make that happen. But this is where we feel like doing the audit, having a call with the agency about the client initially. We'll even go on the discovery call and just listen in and get tips if we have to. Um, that gives everybody, right, the client, the agency, us, transparency, we have a unified goal and a strategy and pricing, right? It makes so much more sense. So uh, that's kind of a long-winded answer, like everything here, but uh, that's that's what's been working for us, and that's where we find it makes sense, and we can do it in a way that does make sense for everybody. Now, with clients, um, you know, in an ideal world, it's always, hey, we're going to work together, we're going to do the audit, we're going to do the setup, we're going to do the build-out, and then you're going to be a client for three years, and we're just going to optimize the account and we're going to do really well financially there. What's your kind of, oh, like, so I guess two questions. One, do you eat a little bit of the cost in the setup knowing that you're going to make it up later on in the optimization standpoint when there's less work to do on the account? And then two, what's your kind of over under for is this client going to be a good fit for three months, six months, a year, two years, you know? How long are we hoping to have this relationship in order for it to be worth our time to bring all the, on this call? Okay, good question. Um, the first question is sometimes we do eat up a little bit of time in the setup, right? Um, 
<clears throat> we have an idea of what we're worth per hour internally, you know, and we try to stay and keep the work within that range. But if we have a client that's coming on and maybe we're going to spend 20 or 30 hours in build out, we're not always going to be able to comp, you know, get all that money back by the hour that we're going to spend. And we do kind of, we've looked at the numbers and we, we're usually at a little bit of kind of a, I don't want to say always a loss or a break even for the first couple months. If it's a, a decent sized build out. If it's just a really small build out, we're not so much having that problem. Um, but for the bigger ones, we are a little bit eating it for the first couple months. Uh, we usually tell people we want a three month minimum agreement, right? We want 90 days to first of all, at least get back in the in the black, number one. And number two is uh, to make sure things are working. Like it doesn't make sense to have a new company come on for less than three months to give us a chance to get into the account, make changes, look at the changes we made and make additional changes, then review those. Like you need a couple months typically of performance to really tweak and optimize and, and make things right. So, and if we, if we can't get a three month commitment out of a person, like it doesn't seem like a good deal. Like why wouldn't they give you a three month commitment, right? So it's a little bit of a, a hoop, right? Um, <clears throat> to answer the other question, we want clients forever, really. I mean, we really do, but we have had problems in the past I can't say they're problems, but they're really not your ideal clients that want to test PPC. And I, I quite honestly told my partners, like, I don't want to take them on anymore. I really, unless they're a big company that understands that they need to do it and they've never done it, that's one thing. But we have other people who have industries where, well, I'm not sure it's going to work. Let's try it for a month or two months or three months. And in those cases, we it's kind of like you said or like you alluded to, we are losing money to some degree for the first couple months, if they're only sticking around for that amount, why go through this whole exercise of doing it for no future benefit, you know? And in some industries, we kind of already know, like this thing may not work, but they're so adamant they want to try it. And we don't like turning people away, but we're getting more and more uh, bogged down with, with work that we know is going to last a while. So why should we jack up our workflow and, and you know, pay our employees or contractors to you know, the in-house guys that we're hiring that work with us to do a bunch of work that, you know, at the end of the day, when we look at the, the profit and loss statement, we're like at a break even, maybe a slight increase, maybe a slight decrease. Like what was the point of that? Right. We don't need the practice is what I'm trying to say here. So um, for temporary kind of test accounts, we're not so thrilled with them. Um, we'll do them, but it, they really have to understand we need a three month minimum. We try for, more if we can, but we don't want to have people like losing money for months if it's just not a good fit for their industry. Uh, and that's really kind of the the bad business approach that we've learned uh, trying to help people. So hope that answers that. Yeah, it does make sense. I mean, I could see, I mean, if you're, that's a good point because if you're testing the space, you know, even if you got them to sign on for a year, if after four months you just see, hey, this isn't going to work, you can't keep doing it. Because yeah, I was going to say, you could, you know, kind of make a commit, say, hey, if you're going to make a three-month commitment, then it's going to be more expensive. If you make a six-month commitment, it's going to be less expensive. But if you're, like you said, you're testing the waters, and if it doesn't work by month two, there's really nothing, not much you can do on your on your end. Well, if, if there's nothing we can identify as a problem, you know, like mm -hmm. maybe the traffic is just too expensive. We have clients that we've had in the past where, their profit margin was less than the cost per click. Like mathematically, that doesn't make sense. They wanted to try it because they had a repeat. There was a, a lifetime value to the client that they were hoping to recoup over time, but that takes time to build up. You don't build a pipeline with recurring in a month and in two months. And we actually did get the more orders than they've ever seen in their business on a monthly basis. But we gave them a strategy to get the recurring in, in place because they knew that their business depended on it. They didn't have a great plan. I provide them with a plan to do that via following up by email, even some phone follow-ups, things like that, which they were not doing, right? So I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, this is not, you're right. It's not going to work if you can't do what you need to do to make it work. Like, you're going to take a front-end loss, but on the back end, you could have a client for two or three or four years that buy every month. Like, you know, it's something you got to think about. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's challenging, and, and for the guys who do want to test, we do front load the setup a little bit more than we would on a on a client who wants to stick around for a while because we're trying to hedge. Like if we're going to do this, we're going to try to make it at least so we're making a little bit of money, right? We're not going to do it for a straight up loss or break even if we can already see that that's going to be the path. And we didn't do it all the time, but 
for the last year or so, that's kind of how we've been doing. If they want to test it, hey, you're going to pay a, a higher fee because you're not willing to commit, right? So we won't have, and we explain it to them, we don't have the longevity of the relationship to justify a lower cost. That makes sense. Um, that brings me to a very good point, and I know this is something that everyone on, you know, in your industry is going to struggle with a little bit, and that is the big divide between traffic and conversion. Um, kind of funny because that sounds like the event coming up, but yep. really, <laughs> <laughs> really, if you're the one driving the traffic, but you're not the one converting the traffic, there's always a little bit of a blame game because you might be doing your job and getting really cheap clicks, customers' leads, but if their funnel doesn't convert, there's quite frankly nothing you can do. So how do you how does that factor into your approach? I mean, is that why you typically work with companies that are already established, have already run some traffic and at least have an idea of their numbers and you go, yes, we can probably make this work? Or how do you kind of vet their funnel basically? Well, you do, you actually hit the nail on the head. I, we prefer to work with people who have a proven funnel if possible. We don't always have that opportunity. So we we look at the sales funnels quite quite honestly. What we do, like we had a, a, a law firm that I'm not going to mention, but let's just say they were a law firm that's spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on pay per click, and they said that they weren't getting any results, any calls or anything at all for six months. And I said, I looked at my partners who on the sales call. I'm like, it's a conversion problem. There's something wrong with the funnel. I I didn't need to see AdWords. Don't tell me AdWords is that broken that when we saw the account, you had some some bad traffic, but you had some decent traffic. You're gonna get something out of that, right? So we go through the funnel. I we did an online form submission. We picked up the phone. We called the the number on the website. We got I believe we got somebody who wasn't a sales person. Like basically the funnel was broken. Let's just put it that way. So we we identified that. Um, we do that when we're looking at doing a pitch or when we're looking at um, the strategy or, or the workflow. Like we identify these things in our process as much as reasonably possible at the time before we become uh, their agency uh, to get an idea. And, and to be really honest with you, um, we look at you know the on-page stuff. Does it look like it's going to convert well? Do we have Google Analytics stats we can look at? Bounce time, I mean bounce rate, uh, time on site, time on page. Uh, average pages, things like that. We will take a look at that if we have it available to get kind of an idea. But one of the biggest problems we found is that people are not tracking. Businesses are not tracking either well or at all. And if some, we have some clients that are double counting conversions that when we hop in AdWords or analytics, we see that there's, you know, they, they don't understand where they are. So it's very difficult if they don't have um, the funnel in place that's proven to get in there and to really know what we're going to find. So we, we basically, once again, set expectations. This is our, this is like the theme of, of this whole hangout, I think. And we let them know, like, listen, we can't see what's happening here. And there's clients that do have conversion tracking, but since it's not a perfect situation, they can't track 100% of all conversions. So we have to look at the overall sales of the business, do some math, figure out what our, what we can see and what we can't see, what that difference is, and kind of project a little bit. Um, but in most cases, what we're having to do is, is set up the tracking, give them recommendations on what to track, how to track it, whether it's phone tracking with um, ACT or with Google AdWords, now that they have phone tracking as well, uh, whether it's tracking conversions, leads, if we can track back to sales. We're doing a, um, for a customer right now, a pretty large brand, they're working with like a Salesforce plugin where we're trying to tie in the AdWords uh, leads back to sales through Salesforce or some integration there we're doing. So it's very difficult to do when you don't have a funnel that works. So part of our job is identifying that because we realize that they don't know how good we're going to do unless we can measure it. We don't know how good we're going to do unless we can measure it. And I think Ben taught this in the course. Number one thing is you got to be able to measure it. And, and if you cannot quantify things, it's very difficult to prove your worth or prove that you're not doing things right. And, uh, and if you haven't gone through the conversion funnel yourself as the person bringing the traffic, then that's kind of a mistake because you know, the traffic is one part of it, right? But we're using keywords, we're using ads, but that leads you somewhere. It leads you to a landing page, sure, but it also leads you to a process that has to result in money for somebody. So it's pretty good to follow the whole path, really look at it, see where the bottleneck is, where are we having drop-offs? Like, I feel like that's part of the job that we do as an agency. It's not really PPC work, but it's something that we do 
over and above that we bring to the table. And these are also things we mentioned in the audit. You know, we want to make sure people understand we're looking at this as well. It's not just your click-through rate is low. Okay, well, great. But what if your click-through rate is low, but it converts like crazy on the back end, right? So who cares if you're profitable? That's what matters. So we look at the whole, the whole picture in that respect. Very, very good answer. Um, so now I have a couple questions. We're going to shift gears. Bouncing around your site, I see you guys got a few different things going on. So I wanted to ask you about some of the tactics on your site. If you've, you know, maybe if you just started them, hey, you don't know, you don't have results yet. But I'm wondering how well they're working for you, and okay. you know, kind of what you would recommend, what you wouldn't recommend. So sure. I see a free PPC audit on the homepage. Is that, you know, how does that work? Is that standard for anyone coming in? And have have you found that to work very well for you? <laughs> Um, at, for right now, it's still free and still standard, and it's worked very well. Uh, we get audit requests weekly, multiple usually, uh, and that's due to some of the other marketing things that we do, which is not necessarily tied to um, just having it on the page. Like People don't just find it because it's free, right? Um, so it has worked really well, and it has opened a lot of good doors, and it's something that you know most companies will offer a free audit, so it's not like we're so different in that respect. Uh, some companies charge for it, which we're probably going to be doing very soon to test and see how it differentiates the kind of quality of clients. Um, and we do get a bunch of tire kickers and time wasters, to, just to be very transparent. Um, but we do get some really good business out of it and good leads, so it's been a great thing to do, and it's been very helpful for us. Do you qualify before you give away a free audit, or no? Uh, well, we ask for information. So you fill out the form, you're gonna get a secondary form which asks for a little more information. We'll do, we'll use Ben's mini audit or the PPC BizBox mini audit to get a feel for what the client's got going on before we even schedule a call or anything. Because we want to get an idea of who we're talking to, if they're spending money, just a couple, you know, whatever in, in information we can find out about them. And then we just make our decision from there. We'll reach out to them, and we'll give anybody a phone call for the most part because sometimes there's people who are big players that you just don't realize they're that big until you get them on the phone, you know. So we're not going to not answer a call unless it's some kind of spammy thing or some kind of industry that we're not, you know, not a good industry or something. We're not going to – we'll probably respond and say we can't do it or something, but we're not going to do an audit. We actually, for the first time ever – and <laughs> my partner Maria, she sends me an audit request to do and that was supposed to be done yesterday – and it's in Dutch. Like, I don't read Dutch. Like, this is one of those examples. I just laughed at her. I'm like, and she was joking around, like, giving me the audit to, to complete. And I'm like, there's, like, almost no English in this entire account. I go to the website. It's in Dutch. Like, what can I do? I'm like, you got to tell this guy we can't do this audit. I'm like, he's, like, begging, you know, can you please take a look at it? Can you please? I'm like, yeah, I'm looking at it. I can see you got, you know, some issues here going on, but I don't know what they are because I can't interpret the data. It was very interesting. So, in those cases, we're not going to do an audit, but for the most part, we'll give everybody the shot and at least take a look at the account if we can. So that being said, I noticed that you guys have a pop-up with a lady. That, that says, is Maria. That is my partner, a, Maria, just so you know. Yeah, they, I, I was going to joke, too, and say, you know, is, is that a fake pretty lady? Is she a real person? Is that a stock photo? <laughs> yeah, I'll let her know you said that. <laughs> and um, how, how is that, has that been useful in your business? I've heard good things about those kind of live chat type windows, you know, how, how do you guys use that? I mean, we haven't had as many people on the live chat, to be quite honest with you. Uh, we've had a few uh, leads come from, but nothing significant. But it does help us to see what people are doing on the site, which is helpful, right? We want to see where, where are people going, uh, what are they doing when they land, is there some place that they're scrolling or clicking that's not working, or they're not seeing what they want. So the main reason we did it really was for the intelligence for what people do on the website. It's not so much so we can just chat with them. That's a benefit that we've been able to get from it here and there, but that wasn't the main reason we implemented it because we realized that <clears throat> we have some SEO work that we've done to the site. We, we rank really well locally especially. We're ranking well nationally for some pretty uh, decent terms. And we also saw that there were pages that weren't converting as well as others. There was, you know, we wanted to get more information, and that's why we decided to add the live chat so we can go through and see what's happening on site and make updates to the website that are, you know, we can visually see a heat map of where people are clicking or where they're scrolling and where they're, you know, where they're dropping off and have an idea. That was the main reason behind it. So that came with the live chat software? Yeah, most live chats, I mean, this one we have actually, you can't see them, there's two of them. Um, one that's hidden because that does the heat maps and stuff, and one that does the a little bit better for live chat, which is the one you can see. Um, but most of the softwares will do it. They're not that expensive. I think you can get a, a basic uh, 
package from, I think I use Lucky Orange on a few sites. It's not, I don't think we use that on this site uh, for like 10 bucks a month. And it, it's pretty good. It gives you everything you need up to a certain amount of visitors, which, you know, we're not hitting hundreds of thousands of visitors a month. So we're, we're good to go. Um, yeah, no, I, I remember I talked with, man, this was, it feels like ages ago. I talked with Jake Howard and one of the guys that he had had on was all about live chat and said that it was, you know, incredible for his business. So that's why I was curious because I saw you doing it. And I was like, huh, I wonder how that's working out for them. Yeah, it so, does actually help in some ways. It's just, we haven't seen the big volume of sales kind of like, I want to buy your service right now. Like it, it's usually not like that. So. <laughs> and the opt-in monster pop-up. Um, collecting leads, how, how is that working out for you? I know pop-ups tend to work pretty well, but I'm curious in, uh, in your business how, how well it's working. It, it's working, it's about the same. I mean, nothing monumental. We are getting subscribers to our newsletter and we send out our podcast every week and things like that. So it, it's been helpful in that respect to help build an audience. Um, I can't say that I can honestly tell you whether or not we're converting an email sign up into an actual customer because the, the process for that is kind of long and it's hard to kind of document. So th I'm sure we've gotten some business out of it. I can't guarantee it's been significant, but to have it on there, we are collecting leads and we are getting them onto our you know autoresponder and our, our um, broadcast emails, things like that. And what's your, what's your kind of goal there? Because obviously when you're collecting these kind of email leads, some of these people might be looking to do PPC services for themselves. Mm -hmm. So... Is it kind of trying to inform, educate, and then hopefully ascend them into a customer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do a weekly podcast as well, um, the PPC Playbook. It's on Webmaster Radio. <clears throat> and that's geared towards people who either are agencies or are just business owners that want to do it themselves. So we're, we want to educate people um, so that they can see either how to do it themselves and do a good job, and then we, you know, we get to help somebody out at the end of the day. Or maybe they see what's really involved to do it right and they don't want to do it, but they know the guys who told them how to do it right and they want to call us. And we've gotten you know, people responding. We've gotten thousands of downloads on a weekly basis for our podcast, which is pretty cool. Um, more than I expected coming out of the gate, to be honest. And, uh, and it's been really helpful that way. So we help educate and position ourselves as authorities and also get some business out of it. Certainly. Have you ever tried kind of selling any sort of training packages or you know, educational materials? We thought about it. I, actually, it was my idea. Um, talked to my partner about we haven't – I've even mapped it out, to be quite honest with you, but it's just not something we've had the um, mind share to do at this point. Um, it's something that I definitely would like to do, at least on a kind of a, you know, if you don't want to hire an agency, do it yourself type of thing. We do offer consulting, like by the hour, so that's kind of – fulfilling a similar role for a customer who doesn't necessarily want the management or they just want the help getting set up or they just want kind of like a one-off thing. Um, but it's a little bit difficult because things don't always work the same in every industry. So we want to make sure we have good information that's going to help everybody that purchases a product. So it, it it's kind of a long process. I mean, you see how long it takes me to answer a question here. Like, can you imagine like our training? <laughs> It would be really long, so. <laughs> Certainly. I mean, I've gone through some of Ben's AdWords stuff, and it's lengthy. Yeah, it can be. Very technical, too, and you don't know where the person's picking up. So, like, how soon do you start? Like, here's where you go to AdWords, and you set up an account. Like, you got to, you know, figure that. Is there beginners? Is there advanced? How advanced do you go? You know, so. Well, that might, have you, I mean, have you ever reached out to the list and, you know, at least offered, hey, you know, by the way, we do consulting. You know, we have some free time you know, if someone wants to come through or having a, having a challenge in your business, because it doesn't just have to be on the AdWords side, you know, it could be on the managing AdWords as a business side. And no, actually, that's, that's a great idea. We haven't actually done one-off uh, kind of calls to action in that kind of a personal way. Um, I, that's a great idea, actually, Sweeney. That's something we'll, we'll talk to the team about. No, because, I mean, that's one of those things, too, where you can gauge interest, and you might get a couple. You never know what kind of emails you're going to get back, and... They might say, hey, yeah, I'd love to do this. Or you might get enough interest that you have a little mini event or a mini workshop. Yeah, you know, that's, that's one of those ways idea. you can leverage your time in a different way and hopefully pre-sell. And then also, you know, to that same list, offering the white labeling services, saying, hey, by the way, you know, we can do this for you. I'm sure you probably mentioned it in the podcast, but having it more of a call to action, direct response type email, you can usually, you, you can at least gauge interest and get a feel. Yeah, no, that's not something we have done on that kind of a service, 
based thing. We've done it more for the educational materials, also for the free audit, like something like that, but we haven't actually reached out specifically about the service, which might be a good idea, actually. Because you, it, you know, it, it always amazes you, but if you don't ask, people don't always tell you, and that's one of those cases where you might ask and you might get four people that hit you back and, oh, I would love, I didn't even know I could white label it, you know, people are, people are so afraid in this day and age, it, for whatever reason, many people are afraid to even ask. Yeah, so if you're you kind of can I preach the same way you're preaching. Yeah, <laughs> you're actually preaching in the choir, but I haven't been uh, at my singing lessons, so yeah. Well, I it happens. I haven't implemented. <laughs> now, um, I'm trying to think. So, looking through my notes, I mean, I basically covered most of the tactics on the site. Is is there any other things? You know, you mentioned the SEO, you mentioned the reviews, which maybe I think we should dive into a bit more because I think that was pretty important. Uh, converting the click, I, I love that phrase. Is there any other tactics outside of the opt-in monster pop-up and those other things that we haven't mentioned that you guys have done for your site that have worked very well for you? Well, we have the AdWords 101, which is a, basically an AdWords 101 guide, almost like what you'd provide a beginner, which is uh, took us a ton of time to do. There's still some updating. There's still some going deeper we want to do. We actually had a meeting about it yesterday. Uh, to make sure that people can understand it. If they have questions, we want to elaborate on, on key issues. Uh, and that was something that we used in our SEO efforts to have links. You know, we want to have good incoming links coming in, and what better way to have a good resource that people want to link to, right? So it wasn't, you can call it link bait if you want to, but it's just offering something that people did actually want to link to. So it's actually been pretty helpful in that respect. Um, we have, um, like I said, the podcast is obviously another thing that we um, – we use as well to uh, to try to get people to reach out and to to speak with us about it. Um, having good reviews, you know, on our Google Plus page, um, we've only pretty much focused on Google Plus. We've only got you know we've gotten our five stars, things like that, um, which has been helpful. Getting real clients to actually leave real reviews, you know, is very important uh, because people look at that and they say, you know, they see you have a podcast, they see you have good reviews, they. You know, you do a search for, uh, you know, PPC agency in our area. You see us everywhere. Like, it starts to build on the authority. And that's really been, like you said, converting the click. Uh, we've had people that have said, I've, like, seen you guys everywhere, you know, uh, doing LinkedIn ads, doing, we're doing Facebook ads for some PPC audits, which, quite frankly, I wasn't really thrilled with the with the results of them. Excuse me while I adjust my headset here. Oh, no way. Um, but, uh, but that may have just been who knows what, right? I mean, it's just... To me, people don't really read the ads in Facebook. They just like to click, click, click a lot of times. So it doesn't didn't always transfer to revenue. Um, but those have been ways. You're trying to be everywhere and trying to have good educational content as well as not trying to oversell people and really trying to help them. Like we really do want to help businesses. has been a way that we can kind of build the trust and convert the click, like you said, is turn them into somebody who not just went to the site but went to the site and also is going to see our remarketing ad and is also going to see – you know, hopefully see us somewhere else when they find a question. We're in the Google AdWords forum, not as much as we should, um, and that's kind of just because, you know, we've been getting really busy, which is great, um, but some of those things tend to fall off a little bit, so that would be another way we've gotten business out of that before. It's just, you know, trying to be a little bit everywhere and being a good resource. And um, for the reviews, I'm curious, have you ever have you ever brought on a client, let's say, for example, that maybe they had pretty pretty sucky reviews? and you ex explicitly said to them, hey, we're going to do this, I think we can do well, but you also need to get your reviews up. You know, Have you ever had any of those cases where you've told the client, we need to get these reviews up, and kind of maybe not had it be a focus of yours, but pushed it back onto the client? Because oh, I know yeah. it's, it's been very successful for you, so I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We tell them all the time, like, if we can get them on the, on the ball, uh, reputation, uh, offering that service, which I've done in my other uh, local marketing business prior to what we're doing with PPC Professionals, and I've used it in my own, bu my own business that I've owned, other businesses for years, you know. I tell people about it all the time. Um, we haven't been focusing on it as a service as of this year. That is one of the other services we're going to be offering for clients rather than just telling them. We, you know, we try to really become the PPC agency of choice and focus there because that's really, I guess, our strongest suit, but we've worked on big SEO deals. We've worked on reputation. We've worked on email. We've worked on on-page. Like, we have all the skills, and part of our, our plan this year is rebranding to not just be PPC professionals, but also incorporate 
uh, where we're not pigeonholing ourselves into one service. Uh, so we will, you know, we will use the reviews as far as fulfilling it. But as far as using it, yeah, we if we can get people on seller ratings for their AdWords, where they have the the stars, you know, the five or four point eight stars or whatever for their product, we recommend it. Um, if it's service based and we know they either have no reviews or bad reviews, we recommend it. Uh, we tell them what to do. How many of them actually do it? If they're not paying you for it, it's amazing how the interest goes down, right? Like they're not as they don't feel like it's as important, but uh, we do at least try to get them to have like their Better Business Bureau logo on the site if, if it's a service-based business or something that people might not be trusting about, like a financial type of client or something like that. We try to get the authority kind of trust factors on page if we can. And then, of course, if they have testimonials, then, yeah, we want to use those on site as well as in other places like Google if it makes sense. All right. So now right before we close it out I don't want to go deep into this because it's something that we cover a lot but when it comes to you guys getting new clients for your business is it typically client referrals is it cold calling you know what what kind of tends to be your best or is it all just kind of coming in what tends uh, to be best for you guys referrals is one is one of the best places it's also like, like I said the uh, the word radio show and that type of thing local SEO has been huge um, getting ranked for our, our terms. We got a lot of people who find us because they want a local company, just like they do a lot of people ranking for their, you know, their city SEO keywords. Well, we're doing that for PPC. Like we want to be found and we want to be the city or the city's choice for PPC, let's say. Um, so that's been really big and no cold calling. We do have a sales team that we started working with last month. Um, that's been filling up our calendar with all kinds of discovery calls. So that's been going really well. And obviously using the PPC prospector, letting them use it as far as identifying um, customers that are already running AdWords. So that's wasting a lot of time. Um, that's been really the biggest thing has been the referrals, local SEO, and just, you know, now having the sales team out there pushing. And a lot of it's incoming. I mean, we're not getting hung up on all day long, cold calling, thank God. You know, that's not my forte at all. Um, you know, we've invested a lot of money and time into the, into the on-page, into the SEO, so we can rank, so we can start getting some incoming leads. We're not chasing people. They're coming to us because the conversion rate is so much different when a person is calling you versus you bugging them. And I, I don't believe – I hate it when it happens to me, so I can't do something that I don't believe in to somebody else and expect a good result. I just personally can't do that. <laughs> it's just me. Makes a lot of sense. Well – Thanks a lot for coming on today. We appreciate it. I know we had you on the Academy before. Much love for you coming on there as well. Happy to have you on the podcast. Cool, man. Appreciate it. It's been great. Let them know uh, Let them know a little bit more about where they can find you, where they can find your podcast. Sure, sure. So we're ppcprofessionals.com, ppcprofessionals with an S. You can go to our website there. You can see a link to our podcast. It's called the PPC Playbook. It happens on a weekly basis. Uh, we've been on for about six months now. You can also go to Webmaster Radio and uh, you can Google Webmaster Radio, and you can see our podcast listed there as well. And come check it out. You know, leave us a review. And let, tell us what you think. Maybe there's topics that you guys want to uh, want us to cover. We're always looking for good, you know, topics to cover. So we're happy for any uh, any suggestions you can offer. And thanks for listening. Thanks a lot, man. Take care, Sweeney.